Um, as, you, as you know, I often give the homework assignment, and my homework assignment was to, last time, was to myself, was to talk about the mechanisms, give more information on the mechanisms of mesozeaxanthin production in the retina and also, and I've added in the retinal pigment epithelium, as you'll see. And you'll have an opportunity, I guess, to grade me later on and see how well I did. So we've heard a little bit today, actually quite a bit today, about the history of mesozeaxanthin, and I, uh, we heard, heard an excellent talk from George here. And I'll reiterate a few things um, of the history of mesozeaxanthin. And we know that mesozeaxanthin is a very unusual xanthophyll carotenoid. It's rarely encountered in nature. And really the Im most important early paper on this was from Mayoka et al., who developed a chiral derivatization method to uh, explore the natural abundance of mesozeaxanthin. And this was a somewhat cumbersome method. It required chemical derivatization. It required running through a, uh, which is always a bad way to do any real quantitation and to do large numbers of samples. And, but he was able to do this and was able to find that fish skin, shrimp shells, turtle fat were some of the sources of mesozeaxanthin. But he really didn't find any significant plant or microbial sources. Uh, Bone and Landrum, as we know, in their classic work published in the 1990s, used this same, you know, somewhat cumbersome method and were, to their surprise, I think, at the time, were able to find that one-third of the human macular pigment was actually mesozeaxanthin. There was as much mesozeaxanthin there as lutein and as much as zeaxanthin. But this type of, uh, of analysis was very difficult, and thanks to the help of people at, at Roche, now DSM, Claude Abisher, uh, we he had just developed a new method of doing a single pass method of doing chiro without derivatization of measuring mesozeaxanthin, separating it from zeaxanthin and from lutein. And using this method, uh, Claude, Fred Katrick, and I used this and confirmed that mesozeaxanthin is essentially, with some very minor exceptions, is I-specific in primates, birds, and amphibians. And this is a very good method, and I'd like to say I heard the good talk about uh, the previous talk here about the two-step method. You can actually use this method as a single pass even on egg yolk, so it's a relatively easy method to do. And I'll show you some chromatograms that you can use this method. So since, the, since 2002, there's been even more information about mesozeaxanthin, and some of it summarized here, some of it I will get into in, a little, in, a, in the next slides. We, in my laboratory, were able to discover that uh, the binding protein for zeaxanthin was GSTP1, and we found that GSTP1 has equal affinity for zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. They're essentially indistinguishable to the binding protein. Both of them bind at high, at high affinity. And we also found that retinal mesozeaxanthin is elevated in the, eyes, in the retinas of, uh, of eye donors who regularly consumed large amounts of lutein supplements prior to death. And this is consistent with the, some of the talk we've heard before about lutein probably being the precursor for mesozeaxanthin that's naturally found in the retina. Uh, we also, in my laboratory, published some work comparing zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, and lutein in some in vitro systems using electron spin resonance and found that mesozeaxanthin was modestly the best of the three as antioxidants and worked even better when in, con in conjunction with all three of these, uh, of, the, of the macular pigment carotenoids. Also, sometime during the 1990s, and I don't have exactly the right uh, year on this, but industrial production for mesozeaxanthin from lutein became feasible. And as we know, over the last decade or two, mesozeaxanthin has entered the market as a component of dietary supplements and as poultry feed. So that's the history. But we still have a lot of mysteries of mesozeaxanthin. And George alluded to this before. Some of the questions include is why does the retina uh, have, and the, and the retinal pigment epithelium, need mesozeaxanthin? Is, is it because it's truly a better antioxidant than zeaxanthin or, or lutein? Or does it act as a secondary source for zeaxanthin, which is relatively uncommon in the typical, uh, in the typical diet? And when it's being made, and so it can be made from lutein. And George gave a, a, give a good description of why that may be happening. And then the more fundamental biochemistry problems that have really not been adequately identified. Is lutein truly the primary precursor? 
or is there some intermediate that actually is going on? Could this be a, a recovery pathway where oxidized carotenoids are just being made back into the xanthophylls that we want, the lutein and zeaxanthin, and it's just an epiphenomenon that's not even enzymatic? Or is this an enzymatic process? Is light somehow involved? We really haven't ruled that out in many situations because the, the eye is a light exposed is a light exposed system. And where does mesozeaxanthin production occur? Is it in the retina? Is it elsewhere in the eye? Is it somewhere else in the body? And then once we have identified an enzyme, is mesozeaxanthin isomerase, if there is such a thing, is there dysregulation of this involved in macular degeneration? or in MACTEL, another disease where you see abnormalities of macular pigment distribution. So, so the, the major components of the macular pigment are the three isomers shown here, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And as isomers, they all have the exact same chemical formula, C40H56O2, but they differ in subtle but important ways. We know that the difference between zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin is just the, the stereochemistry at one chiral center, right here, at the three prime position. That is the only difference here. When you compare lutein to mesozeaxanthin, the chirality is already correct here, but the double bonds have to be shifted if you want to go from lutein to mesozeaxanthin. And the question is, which is the more likely chemical reaction? So if you were to go from zeaxanthin to mesozeaxanthin, you have to invert the chiral center. This is a very, very rare uh, reaction that would occur in nature. That's because, as we know, amino acids are found in one stereochemistry. There are L-amino acids. We don't see them being converted to D-amino acids. Things like that don't happen very often. So this is, although possible, is a relatively unlikely reaction in nature. The other possibility is that lutein is going to mesozeaxanthin by a double bond shift reaction, shown here. These are much more common. These types of things happen in steroid synthesis all the time. The, there's an extraction of a hydrogen, and, you, and it's actually a very, and, and an extraction of a hydrogen from here, and you would be, and you would put, be put a hydrogen here, and possibly in an acid-base type catalysis reaction. These are relatively common in nature. And this would actually be stereochemically favored because it puts this into the conjugation here. And that's why it's so easy to do this under harsh chemical conditions. But this type of reaction has never been observed yet in under, under physiological conditions outside of a living animal. So what do we know? And in some classic experiments done by, done by Liz Johnson and colleagues, we know that if you take monkeys who are deficient in carotenoids and feed them different carotenoids, we were able to identify that lutein was the likely precursor for mesozeaxanthin. And in this experiment, we had either monkeys who were, who were on carotenoid-free diets and not given any other supplements, or they were on the carotenoid-free diet plus a very highly purified lutein supplement that didn't have any zeaxanthin or mesozeaxanthin in it or they were given a carotenoid-free diet with a very highly purified zeaxanthin diet. They unfortunately did not do, they did not do a mesozeaxanthin arm. I don't think they had enough uh, carotenoid. And what they found in this is that there was no detectable mesozeaxanthin in the retina, in the carotenoid, in the, patient, in the monkeys fed the carotenoid-free diet, or the ones fed the zeaxanthin diet. But in the ones fed the lutein diet, there was indeed mesozeaxanthin <coughs> present in the retina. So this was good uh, preliminary evidence that this reaction was probably occurring in the, in, and that lutein was the precursor. We did, at the same time did a, a comparable experiment, this time in Japanese quail, where we used labeled compounds. This is even more specific in terms of saying what are the precursors and what are the products. And we fed these quail their normal diet, but in addition gave them either deuterium-labeled lutein or deuterium labeled zeaxanthin and followed by mass spectrometry. And we found that when we fed deuterium labeled lutein, indeed, we could detect substantial amounts of deuterium labeled mesozeaxanthin in the retina. But when we fed them deuterium labeled zeaxanthin, 
We got a lot of different carotenoids, but we did not get mesozeaxanthin in any significant amounts in the, in the retina of these quails. Again, this at least argues that lutein is the precursor. So we needed to identify a different model system, though, or a best model system to try to get at this better than, the, than what we had now. And that's because monkeys, as we know, are very expensive and difficult to do, to do these sorts of experiments. And the quails, although a pretty good system, we found in analyzing the carotenoids in their eyes that uh, they had a lot of carotenoids. They really had a fairly complicated array of carotenoids in addition to lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, they had galoxanthin, rosafluene, astaxanthin, all sorts of things were in there. So we, wanted, we figured we had to find a different system. And it turns out, as we've, had, we've talked a lot about chickens today, we found that the chicken was really a good, a good system to, to try to get at this problem. And this is because chicken eggs are easy to obtain. And chickens, uh, even the baby chicks, as they're developing, have a large eye size and a very predictable hatching time. And you can grow them in the laboratory. Um, we already know that mesozeaxanthin is not, nat not normally present in the yolk. Only lutein and zeaxanthin are present, so essentially we're giving a controlled feeding experiment to the developing chick embryo. And also in a very important paper that was published, uh, I think in 2007, out of the Connors uh, Laboratory in Portland, is that it was already known that one-day-old chicks have detectable mesozeaxanthin in their retinas. So something's going on. We are, there's already, we know that they're starting out with no mesozeaxanthin in the yolk, but they already have mesozeaxanthin in the retinas. We already talked about why chickens are better than quails in terms of their diversity. One thing to remember, though, is birds are not humans. Their carotenoids are esterified in the, in the retina, and so it's in the oil droplets. So it is a little bit different system. But other tissues, including the retinal pigment epithelium, the liver, the yolk, the brain, and the serum, have unesterified xanthophils. We had, Fred Katchuk and I had already pro proven that before. So in the experimental design that I'm going to be talking about today, we have identified the model system, and we obtained a, a, a set of eggs, uh, quite a few eggs from a chicken farm, that uh, one in Idaho that was a fact, essentially a factory chicken farm, commercial farm. We also did, you did some separate experiments using free-range eggs from uh, Utah farmers, but these were about, there was no differences there. And we isolated the brain, the serum, the liver, the eye, the yolk, and the body parts at various times during development with the goal of trying to learn when and where mesozeaxanthin is being made. So we dissected the retina RPE lens from the tissues, did carotenoid extraction, and HPLC. And that's what I'll be showing you here. So the HPLC analysis was that we had to do organic phase extractions with ester saponification as necessary. And we used a lot of different systems, all single pass uh, HPLC systems, chiral columns, cyano, reverse phase C30, and always with photodiode array detection to be sure that we really were getting what we thought. And shown here is just a chiral column separation where you can see that we can separate easily, almost at baseline, oxalutein, mesozeaxanthin, zeaxanthin, and lutein. And just shown here is an, an E20 retina where you can see there is mesozeaxanthin present, there's oxalutein, and all of the carotenoids are seen there. Uh, normal phase cyano column does not separate zeaxanthin from mesozeaxanthin, so you just see, you see only two major peaks here. And you can see here in an E20 retina, you only see two major peaks and some minor ones here. Uh, C30, uh, you can also do retina, liver, and standards here. And that way, we can also pick up other carotenoids, such as beta-cryptoxanthin. We can look for astaxanthin and canthaxanthin, which we didn't see here. And you can see the differences between retina and liver, and I'll go into those in detail. And egg yolk. Again, you can see the, the various different carotenoids we can detect in standards, but egg yolk is really primarily lutein and zeaxanthin here, and some oxalutein and a few other non-carotenoid compounds. There actually is no beta-cryptoxanthin here. So what did we find in all of our various tissues? Well, we first, of course, had to look at the egg yolk. And our egg yolks here, as you can see, the, the yolks that we are getting at E0 have mostly lutein in about a two to one ratio of lutein to, to zeaxanthin here. 
There is no detectable mesozeaxanthin at any time beyond occasional trace amounts, but we're talking about much below the limit of quantitation here. The only other carotenoid we see is oxolutene, the oxidized lutein, which we see at, very, at relatively small amounts in the early phases, and this decreases even as time through this. But there is no mesozeaxanthin being produced in the egg yolk. We feel quite confident in that. And you can see that the ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin in the yolk started out around two, at baseline around 2 to 1, dropped a little bit at the, at the later time points, about 1.5 to 1. So there's, you can see that the ratio is fairly stable throughout all of the time period of growth. In the liver, the liver is where a lot of carotenoids are delivered, obviously very late in development of the, of the bird in terms of the embryonic day. This E22 or E23 is hatching. You can see here that, again, we see lutein and zeaxanthin building up quite well. Oxolutein, the oxidized compound, appears relatively late in development here. Absolutely no detectable mesozeaxanthin ever in the liver throughout all of these. And these are five, five birds per time point here. That, and you can see everything. You can see the, the error bars here. Ratio is very similar in the, in the liver to exactly what we're seeing in the, in the egg yolk, around 1.5 to 1. And as we'll see, it's very similar to what's going on in the serum. In the brain, a lot, there's a lot of interest in the brain. What's going on in the brain of these birds? Well, you can see lutein and zeaxanthin appears relatively early in development here. Doesn't ri rises some, but not dramatically here. Very little oxolutein in the early phases. Absolutely no mesozeaxanthin present in the brain of these birds. Ratio is about one to, one to one for lutein to zeaxanthin. So this is a little different from what we see in the serum yolk and in the liver. And then in the serum, we had a little harder time. It's harder to collect serum from, uh, from these little developing birds. So there's a little more variation in the, in the concentration. But the ratios stay about the same. And you can see here zeaxanthin, lutein, no mesozeaxanthin detectable at any time, and really no oxolutein either. Ratio is about 1.5 to 1 through the time. So we're here to hear about the eyes, so that's what I'm here, that's what I was most interested in. What's actually happening in the eyes of these birds? So you can see here, we see something very different going on. First to note is that going to E21 at the time, just before hatching, there's significant amounts of mesozeaxanthin present. There is zeaxanthin present. There's lutein present and oxolutein. Mesozeaxanthin appears on, D, on, D, on E17, embryonic day 17. It is not present E15 or E16. So it's developmentally, we're going to see this is developmentally regulated when mesozeaxanthin appears. And this is in the retinal pigment epithelium, not in the retina. Sorry about what I was saying there. But you can see that it appears in the retinal pigment epithelium, E17, and does increase through time. The retina also, also has mesozeaxanthin, as we would expect. But it comes up a few days later here. It comes up about E, barely on E. It's not detectable uh, very much on E17 here. And it comes up and dr rises dramatically here. And we'll look at this in a little more detail as to what's really going on. So you can see here in the chicken, in the RPE, we did five time point, five birds per time point here. At E16 and E15, no mesozeaxanthin is present. On E17, we see a sudden rise here. All five of them become positive and have mesozeaxanthin. This persists with the exception of one bird that we found that did, ha did not have mesozeaxanthin on, on day 19 and continues to rise here. Interestingly, we had, we'll talk about th uh, this one bird that didn't have any mesozeaxanthin in its RPE, had no mesozeaxanthin in its retina either. That's very important, to, and we'll come back to that. And here's what happens in the retina. In E15 and E16, no mesozeaxanthin. E17, only one of the birds was positive, and it was very low. This rises to two out of five. 
the four out of five here, the one out of five that was not uh, positive was the one that had the, where the RPE was not positive. Then by E20 and E21, they all become positive there. So we can see that the ratios are more like one to one through here, more uh, similar to the brain of retina of lutein to zeaxanthin. We can see that the ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin plus mesozeaxanthin is even shows the, oops, shows, go back here, shows that there is more mesozeaxanthin and zeaxanthin present as the, uh, throughout time. So there is a preference for the retina to have more zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. And that's shown here. So what we would argue is that the RPE is probably the source where carotenoids are being, where the mesozeaxanthin is being made. And that most likely in the model, it's being made, it, the carotenoids, the lutein and zeaxanthin are being delivered from the circulation to the retinal pigment epithelium. The isomerization is probably occurring here there then, as there is with retinoids, there would be a transfer from the retinal pigment epithelium to the retina here, where probably on IRBP, the transport protein for retinoids, and we've proven before using surface plasmon resonance that retinoids and carotenoids have equal high affinity for this, for this protein. So the conclusions that I'd like to make are that the chicken embryo is indeed a good system to, to study the macular carotenoid synthesis. We now know that mesozeaxanthin is present in a development, developmentally regulated manner in the RPE and the retina, but not in any other tissue outside of the eye. The, we think that the RPE is the likely site of the isomerization reaction. We can also know that mesozeaxanthin occurs in the absence of light. I forgot to mention these eggs were incubated in complete darkness. They were covered with a blanket. The incubator was covered with blankets. There is no light causing this reaction. And we also Think, you know, need to explore whether mesozeaxanthin isomerase act, uh, activity could be related, deficiencies of this could be related to the pathogenesis of MACTEL and AMD. So in terms of my grade, I'm doing well, but I think I get an incomplete, okay? We still don't know what the isomerization is. The, we are now in the process of doing RNA sequencing to determine the mesozeaxanthin isomerase protein, candidate proteins, by comparing RPE at earlier stages when there is no mesozeaxanthin being made to the days when mesozeaxanthin is being made. We're also working on cell-free enzymology studies using a fresh tissue source of RPE from these developing chickens. Eventually, we will also look at overexpression and knockdown experiments in cultured RPE cells. We also can use this system to look at uh, using labeled carotenoids, we can do microinjection uh, experiments, or we're trying to develop this, where we can inject carotenoids directly into the egg yolk, labeled carotenoids, and follow mesozeaxanthin, oxolutein, all sorts of these precursors as they're being, as they're, without having to go through the feeding experiments that John said, you know, obviously showed it's a pretty difficult thing to do. And then, of course, uh, hopefully within, certainly by the time, by the next carotenoid meeting, even next year at the Gordon Conference, I should, we hopefully will know what the mesozeaxanthin isomerase is. And I'd like to thank all the people in my laboratory and our funding sources. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you for that really exciting work and the amazing new data. Questions to us? Um, I always understand that uh, zeaxanthin and, and uh, mesozeaxanthin is preferentially found in the fovea uh, in, in primates, whereas mm -hmm. in the chicken you say uh, it's found in the RPE all over. Uh, mm -hmm. How can you uh, compare this chicken results with, with actual primate results? Um, well, we know that mesozeaxanthin is found in the RPE. That was not, it was not only in the RPE, in the subfovial RPE. The RPE is, um, is enriched in a lot of carotenoids. It's not as specific, so there's still a last bit that's got probably the binding proteins that's involved in actual enrichment and possibly other transport proteins. So we're not solving everything, but at least we're starting to show how mesozeaxanthin can be made. Paul, do you still think that it's an enzyme? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, th there's, that's really the only explanation. The only ex because you've removed light as, as the possibility with yeah. that. 
And your, your previous work that you presented in Utah on the mouse model, have you moved away from the mouse model? Obviously um, the... We still are working with mouse models mm -hmm. and in, their, in the uptake and in, we can get carotenoids into the eye with the, uh, with the BCO2 knockout mice, but so far, when we fed them lutein, we do not see mesozeaxanthin. So we're not seeing, whatever isomerase activity is not active there. Active but of course, there. once we know, we can work on that too. Thank you, Paul. So um, if I could ask a question for Paul. Yes. Um, in your analysis of retina, <clears throat> did that include the old oil droplets? Yes, so that it, it did. That was all saponified. You have to, you have to do that. Right, um, because I was wondering if it's possible to isolate photoreceptor outer segments, if there's any there, since those are shed into the RPE, if I, I would assume that would be a very minor. I think it would be very minor in development right now. So yeah. I think, you know, basically what we have to go on is that RPE comes up a day or two earlier. Exactly. And it's consistently, if the, R, if the yeah. retina is positive, the RPE is always positive. It's not true the other way around. Mm -hmm. And one other comment, you know, the, the, in terms of the RNA sequencing that we do, uh, we think that's a very powerful method. It doesn't always work, but there's been some very nice work by Joe Corbo's group in uh, University of Was at, or Washington University, where they've done RNA sequencing of, a, of the fact that there's a switch in the retinoid, in retinoids where they go from vitamin A1 to vitamin A2, and it's under the, it's in fish and that occurs under the influence of thyroid hormone. And in that model, that just by giving thyroid hormone, comparing the thyroid hormone treated fish and the ones who weren't, one protein came out right from there. They got, they got their answer right away on that. It was a cytochrome that is responsible for introducing another double bond and converting vitamin A1 to vitamin A2. So it shows the kind of families we may be looking for for this type of reaction. Okay, okay well thank you so much, Paul. We're off to break. Right about on time. Almost. Oh,